everybody. Look who I've got with me. Surprise. Let me move this way. There we go. How is everybody doing tonight? How are you doing tonight? I'm doing pretty good. Hang in there. I'm ready for summer. We're both, first year teacher. we're both teachers, so yeah, this time of year can be kind of rough. Springtime, the kids have just had spring break, so they kind of get that little taste of summer, so it's kind of, it's kind of tough. Yeah, they're starting to go crazy. <laughs> they're going crazy. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well. All the teachers are just hanging in there. <laughs> Make sure that you tell us that you're here. Say hi, so we can see, uh, we can say hi to you back. So tonight we're going to be talking about um, the woman caught in adultery, Jesus, um, when the leaders bring this woman to him. And it's funny because when we knew we were going to do this, I started thinking about, well, what Bible story kind of is my favorite? And then Hannah asked her to think about it too, and we both came up with the same thing. There's Dona. Hey, Dona. Hey, Dona. <laughs> um, you're going to have to forgive me for not like typing back because... I've never done that before. She's not going to multitask. <laughs> I'm not going to multitask, exactly. I'll just say hi. Um, so we both thought of the same story. Hey, Tom. Hey, Rosemary. Hey, guys. Um, and I thought that was just kind of interesting that we both thought of the same story. There's definitely a lot of stories that I like about Jesus, especially when it comes to Jesus and women. Um, but yeah. what I think are probably my favorite just and I think my favorite varies just depending on like what I'm going through in life. But yeah, definitely the woman caught in adultery has been one of my favorites. Why do you think it's one of your favorites? I just think that I can see two perspectives from the story, yeah. and I think it's important to keep in mind. For one, I feel like I can relate to the woman caught in adultery for you know being a sinner, mm -hmm. um, but also I can yeah. feel like the Pharisee at the same time mm -hmm. um, when there's another person that I know that has sinned or that's fallen short and mm -hmm. then I'm the one that's holding the stones and I have to look to Jesus and so I can definitely see myself in both positions mm -hmm. from both sides of the spectrum and I think that's one of the reasons why I like the story so much is yeah. because it's so relatable. There's so many different points of view, so many things going on. So this story actually is only found in the book of John. And if you, in your Bible, it probably, if you open it up to John chapter eight, um, verses one through, let's see, verses one through 11. If you look at that in your Bible, there may be a little note at the bottom that says that um, this was not found in the earliest manuscripts. And that's true. It was not found in the earliest manuscripts. So um, tradition goes that it was passed down orally, oral tradition for a while. And then eventually it was written down. So the first time it was cited was third century, um, sometime also in the second century. But everybody agrees that this is a story that happened with Jesus and that it we can count on it, that it's the truth. So we're going to go ahead and study this today. Um, Go ahead, Hannah, and talk to us about the Messiah and how the religious leaders and the Pharisees were looking for a Messiah. So the Pharisees have been looking for a Messiah for obviously a really long time, going back to the Old Testament. And they have this idea of who the Messiah is going to be. And so when Jesus comes along, he is nothing like the Messiah that they predicted, for one, because of you know, his whole birth story that we know. Mm -hmm. And to us, I think it can, it's just kind of an average story that we, we tend to water down because we talk about it so much. Mm -hmm. But for that time period, people really didn't believe that it was possible for the Messiah to be born in such lowly circumstances mm -hmm. like Jesus was. Right. And that's one of the reasons why it was hard for him to gain credibility among Pharisees and other right. people like that. Because they just presume that if there's going to be someone, a Messiah, that's born, he's going to already be born in this powerful circumstance or situation. Right. And mm -hmm. so Jesus was already way different than they had imagined him to be. Right. And then when he comes along too and grows up, he's not embracing everything that they are teaching and that yeah. they are, I guess, telling people they should be doing. Jesus is actually disrupting right, um, right. the religious system right. because it was based on 
more of a legal system than yes. it was based on what Jesus is actually about. Yes. And so I just think that that's crazy because, and this story is one of those that really exemplifies how different Jesus was than mm -hmm. who they pictured. He was, right. he was not someone who was hellfire and brimstone. Right. Um, the first to punish people when they sinned. It was a completely different person. Right. So you can actually go back to the Psalms, and the Psalms, that book actually points to a Messiah. And it talks a lot about how the Messiah will be filled with truthfulness, with meekness, and righteousness. So even though he didn't have the credentials that they thought he should have, they did see in him this truthfulness and meekness and righteousness but the righteousness got their goat yeah. they didn't like that they wanted to trip him up they were always looking for a way to trip him up and so in this story they're trying to do just that so why yeah, don't you go and, ahead well and one other note is i think that the righteousness that they were seeing was different right so in their mind righteousness would have been a perfect person that's following all of the these law. religious mm -hmm. laws and Jesus said I mean he literally says I have come to get away with that law to do yeah. away with that and to replace it well to fulfill it yeah to fulfill it yeah all right so I'm going to be reading this is John yes John chapter 8 verses 1 through 11 okay. so Jesus returned to the Mount of Olives but early the next morning he was back again at the temple a crowd soon gathered, and he sat down and taught them. As he was speaking, the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery. They put her in front of the crowd. Teacher, they said to Jesus, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses says to stone her. What do you say? They were trying to trap him into saying something they could use against him, but Jesus stooped down and wrote in the dust with his finger. They kept demanding an answer, so he stood up again and said, All right, but let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. Then he stooped down again and wrote in the dust. When the accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest, until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. Then Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, Where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said. And Jesus said, neither do I. Go and sin no more. So they were looking for justice, they said, because they brought this woman and they said what was supposed to happen to her according to the law. So let's look at what the law says. If you, if you flip over your Bible to Leviticus um, chapter 20, uh, verse 10, we're going to go back to the law and what it says about adultery and what should happen to those who commit it. If a man commits adultery with his neighbor's wife, both the man, both the man and the woman who have committed adultery must be put to death. So not just the one, where's the man? <laughs> That's a two. question that I asked myself when I was reading this story. <laughs> it takes two, right? So where's the man at? That's, that's the big question. And did they really want justice? We know obviously they did not. He, he um, showed what their true motives were. Because if they wanted justice, they would have brought the man as well. I read some things um, that actually talked about maybe the, the man was one of the accusers. Um, we don't know. We don't know where he was. But it kind of sounds like a setup to me. Is it yeah. to you? Oh, definitely. They caught her in the act. So it's almost like they set up a trap for her. Or maybe they were, had just been following her and they, they knew what she was doing, what was going on. Um, we know that she's not a prostitute, okay? We know that she is a married woman because in this time period, um, it would not be adultery for the man unless the woman was also married because a man could actually have multiple wives. He could have concubines, mm -hmm. which to me, that's like girlfriends on the side or something. I don't know. It's the same thing. <laughs> yeah, so it wasn't going to be adultery unless it was actually with someone married to another man. And so in Leviticus, it talks about neighbor's wife. She's someone's wife. So they both should be stoned. That's the law. That would be justice coming to uh, to, to, uh, to bid there. Um, I don't know. I just feel like 
just feel like she was set up. I can't, I can't get past that. Yeah. You know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. But what do you think about when he, what he did? He wrote in the sand. What do you think about that? One thing that I think is really interesting about those stories, there's a lot of speculation on what he was writing in the sand, and some people believe that he was writing the sins of her accusers in the sand, yeah. which is incredibly powerful. Mm-hmm. Um, but one, it's just, it's another example of how mm-hmm. the Pharisees are trying to trap Jesus, which, yeah. you know, that will go on throughout the New Testament. Um, because he's just, once again, so different than what they imagined. Mm -hmm. And um, the fact that he stoops down in the sand and he literally doesn't really say anything to Mm -hmm. them. He doesn't utter a word. He just starts writing in the sand. And people believe that what he was writing in the sand, some people believe that it was their sins, in a sense to kind of show them, Mm -hmm. I know what you've done. Or maybe the law, maybe the Ten Commandments. Maybe he's yeah, that. yeah. Some people believe also he was writing the Ten Commandments. So there's a lot of speculation in what he was doing. But either way, mm-hmm. he showed no like judgment toward her. Right. And that's not to say that what she did wasn't a sin, but it's right. just how he handles it that once again right. goes against what they presumed about. Just, him. just imagine. Just put yourself in her position. She's been thrown in front of this crowd because right before that, the verse before chapter eight says that he's, he's teaching a crowd of people and the religious leaders and the Pharisees, they bring her to him in front of this crowd. So all of these people are looking at her. Imagine the shame and the humiliation, the embarrassment that she's, their, their eyes are boring into her. You know what that feels like when people are staring at you. So Jesus, he gets down on his knees He's writing in the sand. What what happens when he does that? They just all start to leave. What, well, it says not, one not, by not, one. not yet. They they're looking at him, right? Yeah, yeah. They stop looking at her, and they look they're at him. They're watching him, see what he's doing. So I feel like he did that because he wanted to take the pressure off of her and put it on himself. That's what I feel like he did. He may not have been writing anything. We don't know. But the point is, he took the pressure off of her and put it on himself. And then when he said, you know, okay, okay, fine. When they kept on, they kept on, come on, say something, say something. Finally, he stands up and says, he is what the first has the no sin. Then you can cast the first stone, right? And then, like you said, they all started going away. Yeah. To walk away. Um, Starting with the oldest. Did you catch that? Mm -hmm. Why is that in there? The oldest person that was there accusing her was the first person to leave and say, it's almost like wisdom, you know, more with, he had more wisdom mm-hmm. to realize and maybe less pride. I think with, with wisdom, you have less pride. Definitely. Um, so maybe that's part of it. So you talked a little bit about the beginning, in the beginning of this, that you could see yourself in the story. Mm-hmm. So let me ask y'all, and you guys can, can give us in your comments too, um, what do you guys think about this? Who do you see yourself in the story, and I can re- I can relate to the Pharisees. I can being judgmental, yeah. you know, saying like, okay, my sin is not as bad as that sin over there. So you know, it's easy to say that. It's easy to say that sins are compartmentalized and one's worse than another. And we know that's not true. A sin is a sin. One sin condemns you, mm-hmm. right? So um, let me ask you this: Do you think that punishment? Um, it's going to make us better people. It's going to transform us. Could you repeat that one more if, time? Okay. So say for instance, that you know that if you do something, you're going to be punished for it. You're going to endure something horrible. Is that going to prevent you from doing it? I think, yeah, it would. I think sometimes, I mean, it depends on what it is, but I mean, for the most part, yeah, I would say so? so. Knowing that you were going to be punished, I think that's why people try to be so secretive when they do something wrong. Well, imagine that, okay, the sin of adultery. Just imagine the sin. So obviously there is some pleasure there, right? Yeah. Or people, they, they know it was wrong. She knew mm-hmm. it was wrong. She knew that obviously. Yeah, but we don't know anyway. like the background of what even happened though. Like, right. like did they have some sort of 
friendship relationship was the guy blackmailing her i mean there could be so many <laughs> i have a wild imagination way out there. but um anyway <laughs> well but what i'm trying to get you to see is she knew that that was the punishment she yeah. she knew the law that she should die for what she did but she did it anyway and i think that's the same with us we know certain things are harmful to us or hurtful that are sins and we still do them yeah i mean as a teacher example, I mean, <laughs> for the most part with me, when I know something's wrong, that idea of the punishment definitely um, deters me, but it doesn't always deter me. Right. Um, and I think with like my kids, when they don't study for a test, the obvious thing that they want to do is cheat. Mm. And at, like when they're doing it, they're, they know it's wrong. Right. But, um, they're doing it for that reward. Yeah, and so when yeah. they get caught, they know what the punishment's going to be, but that doesn't mean that they're not upset about it. Yeah. They're definitely going to be upset about it. Right. But right. kind of going along with that, yeah. definitely. Well, what I'm trying to get at is Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Now go and sin no more. So we have that same promise that God can help us, that Jesus can help us overcome whatever sin we're dealing with. It's called the transforming power of love, right? So that to me is a bigger motivator, love and knowing that how much Jesus loves me, knowing that his grace is unending, what he's done for me, that is more of a motivator to me to want to do the right thing. The punishment, it might, you know, for a second, you might have a second thought about it, but ultimately, think about speeding. We know that if we speed, that we could get we could get pulled over and get a ticket. I, I know a little too well, you know, <laughs> but we do it anyway sometimes. So I just feel like when you know that Jesus died for you, loves you so much, forgives you, whatever you've done, does not condemn you, that makes you want to like. Show him how much you love him back. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's the idea that love produces obedience. You don't want mm -hmm. someone to listen to you because they're afraid of you or afraid right. of what you're going to do. You want someone to love you because you love them or, you mm -hmm. know, vice versa. You want to build it out of love, not out of fear. That's how it is with parents. You don't want your kids to just be like, you know, we have to obey you or whatever. They, you want them to do it out of love because that they, they love you back. It's the same thing. Yeah. So let's go ahead and look at some other things that Jesus said um, about forgiveness. Because in this story, not only um, does he show, you know, the woman, he doesn't condemn her, but he highlights all the sins of everybody else that's there. He, he makes it a level playing field. We're all in the same boat. None of us can cast a stone because we all have sin. So he's going to talk about in other places how it's important to forgive each other. So Jesus forgives us, so then we need to forgive each other. So I'm going to go ahead and read. Um, I'm going to flip over to, actually, if you'll read it, Hannah, Matthew 6. Matthew 6. 14 through 16. Right. If you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly father will forgive you. But if you refuse to forgive others, your father will not forgive your sons. And when you fast, don't make it obvious as the hypocrites do, for they try to look miserable and disheveled so people will admire them for their fasting. I tell you the truth, that is the only reward they will ever get. But when you fast, comb your hair and wash your face. Then no one will notice that you are fasting except your father who knows what you do in private. And your father who sees everything will reward you. So what do you think about that? you got to forgive others because yeah. he forgave you. Mm -hmm. right. I mean, it makes sense. If you want to be forgiven, then mm -hmm. you need to do some forgiving yourself. Right. Because no one's perfect. Yeah. So he also talks about judging others. If you flip over to um, Luke chapter 6. Verse 37, you know, you hear people a lot of times they'll throw that at you. Well, don't, don't judge me. Jesus said, don't judge. Well, he actually did say not to judge others. So in verse 37, do not judge others and you will not be judged. Do not condemn others or it will all come back against you. Forgive others and you will be forgiven. Give and you will receive. 
Your gift will return to you in full, pressed down, shaken together to make room for more, running over and poured into your lap. The amount you give will determine the amount you get back. So, I mean, I love that. It, it, the story of the woman, he acted it out. He showed it. He showed that, you know, we do not need to judge others. They didn't need to be judging her because they were guilty as well. Just like I'm guilty as well. We're all guilty as well. Yeah. And I think this is something that a lot of Christians struggle with. I mean, speaking for mm -hmm. just myself too, but we have this idea, I mean, and we know what's wrong and what's right. And I think it's really easy for us to cast judgment on other people, but that's mm -hmm. not our job. Right. Our job, Jesus didn't command us to judge people. He commanded mm -hmm. us to love them. Right. Good point. There's one judge, right? It's not me. It's definitely not, <laughs> it's not you. <laughs> what he did command us to do is to forgive others, um, to love others. And we are we can be ministers actually of this love, ministers of reconciliation. And so Paul talks about this in Second Corinthians um, chapter five. And if you would read starting in let's see, verse 18 all the way through um, 21. And all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offer offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. Yeah. You have any comments on that? I mean, it's powerful. Yeah. We're supposed to be ministers of reconciliation, not casters of judgment, not telling everybody what they're doing wrong and how they're going to go to hell. We're supposed to be showing them how they can get back to God. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but you're right. It's beautiful. I think, I think that goes back too as well being you know when he talks about being ambassadors being ambassadors of god's love you know going back to what i said earlier mm -hmm. we're not instruments of judgment we're mm -hmm. supposed to love others and in loving others that's how you introduce them to who christ is even though right. we are all imperfect right. you can lead them to a perfect savior which is jesus yeah um that's just, I mean, that's kind of what I think about when I see this and going back also, when you love someone, you want to do what's good for them. You want to obey them and mm -hmm. yeah. So you're not fearing them. You're doing things out of love. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree with that. So let's just break this down. What do we learn from this story? If you had to say, what's your biggest takeaway from the story of the woman caught in adultery? So I want to take it from two different perspectives. Mm -hmm. The first one that I want to take is the woman um, mm -hmm. caught in adultery. Um, and I think that this can transfer over to everybody's life because mm -hmm. we're all sinners. We all fall short. And I think a lot of us, it's really hard for us um, to get stuck in not just sin, but in kind of muddling about it and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. be feeling down that we did something wrong and beating ourselves up about it right and i think the message of this story is yes we all sin and that doesn't mean to just keep on sinning because god loves you no matter what mm -hmm. it means that because of his love for you and his forgiveness mm -hmm. to just return to him every single time and yeah. and learn from it ultimately mm -hmm. and sometimes we're going to make the same mistakes but that's when i think that his love is it covers us his grace covers right. us right. and that's kind of the message that i take from the woman caught in adultery is just the mm -hmm. message of god's love but also um from the perspective of the pharisees because i like i said can see myself in both of these positions it's not my job to judge anyone and so I mm -hmm. think it's really easy for me sometimes to pick up those stones and to mm -hmm. want to throw them at people who yeah. I know are doing something wrong yeah. or just in several different situations. Um, yeah. And so I think it reminds me that I need, I need to put those stones down because mm -hmm. I am a sinner. I am the woman caught in adultery. Mm -hmm. I'm also the Pharisee. Yeah. And 
no matter what, God's love covers me in each of those situations. But ultimately, I would say the baseline message I get from this is just his love. You know, his love covers us. Um, and it's also not my job to judge people. Yeah. He has just commanded me to love others. The yeah. judging, it's, it's not mine to do. I just love in the story how Jesus is so wise. Um, he, they give him these two choices. And if he does one, he is making a mistake. And if he does the other, he is. So mm -hmm. if he says, yeah, you need a stoner because you need to fulfill the law, then he's not showing his mercy. He's not showing the kind of compassionate person he's been through his ministry. But if he says, well, no, don't stone her, then he's not fulfilling the law, which he says that that's what he's here to do. So he just turns the whole thing on its head. Yeah. And totally just, it's like, whew, you know, it's just, it's great. I just, I love, yeah. I love how he just, few words, just puts it right out there and, and they can't argue with it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the last thing I want to ask you is, I've got a couple more minutes. I think... Um, this story, like any story in the Bible, when we read the Bible, we shouldn't just read it and go, oh, that's a great story. You know, I like that. It should change us. It should transform us in some way. That's the whole point. It's not just to study, to have all this knowledge and say that you know things. It's mm -hmm. so that it can change your life. So how does this story change your life? And you guys can put in the comments too. How does this story change your life? Hopefully it does in some way. Yeah. Yeah. You have anything with that? How, how does it change it? your life? Yeah. How does it change my life? Um, I think I used to live in fear of condemnation. Um, mm -hmm. And I really didn't take this internalize the story. But when you really internalize the message, you no longer live in fear. You no longer live in condemnation. Because I'm a sinner, obviously. And... Um, there are, like you said earlier, there's some sins that we, we struggle with and maybe we will, we will do those again, but God is going to help us. Jesus helps us, gives us that power, his spirit living in us to help us get better and to overcome the struggles that we have. He's there holding our hand. He's there with, he's not there condemning us. He's there holding our hand and, and you know, cheering us on. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, that's really all we have for tonight. But we're glad that you joined us. Um, ben should be back any minute now, hopefully. Um, but we just thought we would sit in since he couldn't be here. Uh, would you say a prayer for us tonight? Yeah, pray for us, buddy. God, we just thank you so much for this opportunity that we have to share your message and to also gather together, even though it's not in person, it's virtually to get together and to be able to talk with one another and to share with one another. I thank you so much for this story, Lord, this excellent example of our Savior that we have and this reminder of his love for us. And also the reminder that when we do sin, as we all will, that your love just brings us back home. You call us to us. You call us to you. And God, I also thank you for the reminder that we have that judging others is not our responsibility. And thank you so much for taking that burden off of us. And I pray that you would continuously remind each of us that that is not in our area of expertise. That's not our job. And we fully commit that job to you, Lord. And we pray that you would fill us with what we need to go out into the world and to love others as you have called us to love. And in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Y'all have a great evening and see you next week, if not before. Good night. Bye.